embracing a new perspective. It was 9 p.m. California time, which meant it was midnight in Michigan. I glanced at my phone. I thought about waiting until the morning, but I was feeling desperate. I couldn't wait, so I started to dial. By December 2008, I'd been out of pain for a couple of years. Life was good again, until the night of the accident. I had a great day leading up to it. I got lunch with a friend, worked out at the gym, and went to see that movie where Brad Pitt ages backward. Spoiler alert, he dies of old age as a baby. As I was waiting to exit the movie theater parking lot, I saw that a car was headed straight toward me. I blasted my horn, but it was too late. He crashed into my passenger side door. The driver was very apologetic and assured me that his insurance company would fix my car. There was just one small problem. My back was in agony. By the time I got home, I was close to panic. Did the accident mess up my spine? Or is this just my neuroplastic pain rearing its ugly head? It was late at night. I was in pain and I was terrified, so I did what any reasonable person would do. I called one of the world's leading experts on diagnosing pain. You might remember Dr. Howard Schubiner from earlier in the book. He evaluated the patients in the Boulder Back Pain Study to determine whether their pain was neuroplastic or caused by structural problems. Dr. Schubiner is a board-certified internist and the founder of the Mind-Body Medicine Program at Providence Hospital in Michigan. He's brilliant and insightful, but best of all, he doesn't turn off his ringer when he goes to sleep. To this day, I have no idea what water molecules had to do with anything, but I felt reassured. My brain calmed down, and over the next couple of hours, my back pain dissipated completely. The moral of the story, what can we learn from my car accident? Besides the fact that Howard Schubiner is a really nice guy. After the accident, I developed pain, which led to fear, which led to more pain. I had fallen right back into the pain-fear cycle. But I didn't just have fear of the pain. I had a very specific fear that the pain was caused by a physical problem in my back. I was scared of the pain because I thought it meant that something was broken or ruptured or otherwise damaged in my body. And this is the exact fear that fuels neuroplastic pain. When we're in pain, we naturally conclude that there's a physical cause. Maybe we believe it's inflammation or scar tissue or arthritis. Maybe we think it's a disc problem or a nerve issue or a curved spine. Maybe we suspect it's per posture or muscle weakness or a vitamin deficiency. Regardless of the specifics, at a core level, all chronic pain patients have the same fear. There has to be something going on in my body that's causing this. And when the brain believes that the body is damaged, it responds with pain. But when you can embrace a different belief that the pain is due to your brain making a mistake and that your body is fine, then the fear goes away. And soon after, the pain fades. Which brings us back to my car accident. Once Dr. Schubiner explained that the collision couldn't have caused the physical problem in my back, the fear went away. I still felt pain for a little bit, but I was able to look at it differently. I knew it was a false alarm. By eliminating fear, I had taken away the fuel for the pain. Within a few hours, my brain stopped interpreting the pain as dangerous, and the pain disappeared. To eliminate neuroplastic pain, we need to accept that there's no physical problem in the body. It's possible. I've done it, and I've helped my patients do it. But it's not easy, and there are three main barriers to overcome. Barrier 1. Biology. Many of my patients have a hard time believing that their pain could be caused by their brains. Even if they believe it logically, on a gut level they feel like there has to be something wrong with their bodies. There's a simple reason for this. Biology. Over millions of years of evolution, We've been wired to link physical pain with physical injury in order to protect ourselves. What would happen if we didn't have this biological instinct? Well, just ask Pete Reiser. Pete Reiser was one of the best baseball players of all time, but there's a reason that you've never heard of him. His career ended before it really began. Pete had everything you could want in a baseball player. Power, speed, a really cool nickname, Pistol Pete. But one thing he didn't have was common sense. Whenever Pete would get injured, he just keep playing. He broke his arm and kept throwing for weeks. He fractured his ankle and batted the next day. No matter how bad the injury, Pete refused to let his body heal, and his playing career was eventually cut short. We've been wired to link pain with physical injury to prevent this exact problem. When we get injured, we know to give our bodies time to heal, and soon after, we're good as new. But in the case of neuroplastic pain, this biological instinct holds us back from recovery. Our brains are telling us, there's something wrong with your body, even though there isn't. To overcome this barrier, 
we need to embrace a perspective that's counterintuitive. My pain makes me feel like I have a physical injury, but in this case, it's actually a false alarm. Barrier 2. Conditioned Responses In the late 1960s, comedian Steve Martin was on top of the world. His career was taking off, he was making good money, and he was dating up a storm. But then one night, it all came crashing down. He was out with his friends when, out of nowhere, he had a crippling panic attack. My heart began to race above 200 beats per minute, he said. The saliva drained from my mouth so completely that I could not move my tongue. The next day he was feeling better, but that evening, he had another panic attack. His brain had developed an unfortunate connection. He came to associate nighttime with anxiety, and this association lasted for months. During the day he was fine, but as soon as the sun set, he was a mess. This is called a conditioned response. His brain connected a physical symptom with a neutral trigger. Evolutionarily speaking, conditioned responses are helpful. If you eat a poisonous berry and get sick, your brain creates an association. It puts a danger sign up, and after that, just the smell of that berry can make you nauseated. Conditioned responses can protect us from repeating dangerous behaviors. But what if that berry wasn't poisonous? What if you just happened to catch a stomach bug shortly after eating it? Your brain, not taking any chances, might create an association anyway, and put a danger sign up on food that's actually safe. This type of conditioned response is very common in people with neuroplastic pain. It happens when pain becomes linked with a physical position or activity. The pain isn't caused by the position or activity. Rather, the brain creates an association between the two. And this association can make us think that there's something structurally wrong with our bodies. During my chronic pain days, I developed a number of conditioned responses. When I had knee pain, walking was the trigger. When I had shoulder pain, it hurt just to put on a jacket. When I had neck pain, I couldn't turn my head to the left, which made changing lanes on the freeway particularly tricky. But the worst conditioned response of all was sitting. Within minutes of sitting down, my back began to hurt. The longer I sat, the worse it got. And it was specific too. Hard chairs were worse than soft chairs. Short chairs were worse than tall chairs. Don't even get me started on benches. I became a chair expert. I knew which movie theaters were the most comfortable. I knew which restaurant had the best seats. Answer, Mackay Lounge. So tall, so cushy. But in truth, the chairs themselves weren't causing my back pain, no matter how much it seemed like they were. My brain had just formed a certain connection sitting equals dangerous. The chairs would trigger pain, not because they put pressure on my spine, but because my brain had developed an association. There was nothing inherently bad about nighttime that caused Steve Martin's anxiety, and there was nothing inherently bad about chairs that caused my pain. We both had very strong conditioned responses. How do I know it was a conditioned response, and not the chairs that were causing my pain? because now I can sit in any type of chair for any length of time with no pain. My back hasn't changed, the chairs haven't changed. The only thing that's changed is that I unlearned the conditioned response. Conditioned responses can make it hard to believe that your pain is caused by your brain. If you have back pain every time you sit, it makes sense to think it's the sitting that's causing your pain. After all, everything you've ever learned about cause and effect is telling you that's what it is. But if you have neuroplastic pain, it isn't the sitting or standing, or walking that's causing your pain, it's a conditioned response. Your brain has developed an association between a position or activity and the onset of pain. But just as these associations can be learned, they can be unlearned. Barrier 3. Medical Diagnoses Modern medicine is rooted in something called the biomedical model, which focuses on treating a condition by finding a single, structural cause and fixing it. When you suffer an injury, the biomedical model can be really helpful. For example, imagine you injure your wrist trying to slam dunk on a children's basketball hoop. Don't laugh, it could happen to anyone. First, a physician will take an x-ray to make sure there's no fracture. Then they'll examine you to determine the degree of the sprain. Finally, they'll give you a brace to immobilize your wrist for a few weeks, allowing it to heal. Score 1 for modern medicine, but in the case of chronic pain, the biomedical model often hurts more than it helps. Doctors are trained to look for structural causes, and when you look for structural issues, you're likely to find some, even if they aren't actually causing the problem. Many chronic pain sufferers have been given diagnoses by physicians, degenerative disc disease, repetitive strain injury, fibromyalgia, the list goes on and on. Sometimes these diagnoses are actually comforting. Having pain and not knowing why is terrible. The uncertainty can be overwhelming. When you're given an explanation for your symptoms, 
it can bring enormous relief. But there's a downside to these medical diagnoses. They reinforce the idea that there's something wrong with your body, even if there isn't. I mentioned this in chapter 2, but it's worth repeating. Most chronic pain is neuroplastic. We may develop wear and tear, we may suffer injuries, but our bodies are quite robust and resilient. Patient perspective. I had all kinds of pain. I had pain in my knees, feet, rib cage, and shoulder. But the pain that kept me up at night was my wrist pain. I bounced around from doctor to doctor, trying to find out what was wrong with my wrists. Most of them told me it was tendonitis. The internet was my worst enemy. I would go on tendonitis websites, and they'd say that you have to ice your wrists for two hours a day, and if you keep using them, you'll deteriorate your tendons further. I was so worried that they were going to get worse and worse. I couldn't think about anything else, so I couldn't talk about anything else. I couldn't connect with my friends anymore. It was incredibly isolating. My life had just stopped. I needed to devote all my attention and energy to getting better. It felt like quicksand. When I learned that my brain could be causing my pain, I thought, this makes so much sense and I'm so inspired. But there was also a part of me saying, but what if this is all wrong? and it's going to get so much worse. It was hard to let go of these structural beliefs because I'd been reinforcing them for three or four years. It took a couple months of uncertainty and going back and forth before I was able to accept that there was nothing wrong with my body. Once that belief really stuck, it was incredibly liberating. Even before the pain totally went away, I felt freed and powerful. I started going back to school, started driving again was in classes again. I remember sitting in the cafeteria one day and thinking, I'm out in the world. This is amazing. I'm a person again. I'm a whole person again. Emmett. Overcoming barriers. These three barriers can make it difficult to accept that our pain is neuroplastic. They reinforce the belief that chronic pain is coming from our bodies, keeping us stuck in the pain-fear cycle. Luckily, there's a single solution to overcoming these barriers. Evidence. The more evidence you have that there's nothing wrong with your body, the easier it is to believe that your brain is the culprit. And the most compelling type of evidence is when your pain deviates from its normal pattern. I discovered this in a rather unlikely place, searching for exceptions. I had chronic back pain for two long years. During that time, I saw a team of physicians, physical therapists, chiropractors, and acupuncturists. But the team that helped me the most was the Los Angeles Lakers. In April 2006, I went to a basketball game. Sitting was always painful for me, but I wasn't about to miss my hometown Lakers playing the Phoenix Suns in the playoffs. And what a game! In the fourth quarter, the Lakers made a thrilling comeback and hit a last-second shot to push it into overtime. The crowd went crazy, overtime was even more exciting, and they made another last-second shot to win the game. It was pandemonium, but nobody in the stadium was more excited than I was, because for the first time in two years, I was sitting without pain. Sometimes when we're enjoying the moment, we deprive our pain of its one fuel source, fear. I was so absorbed in the game that I turned off the danger signals in my brain without even realizing it. In other words, the Lakers distracted me out of the pain-fear cycle. I had just gotten my first piece of evidence that my pain wasn't caused by sitting. How could it be? I'd been sitting for three hours, and my back was feeling fine. This is called an exception an instance when the pain behaves differently from how it would if it were actually caused by a physical problem. Finding exceptions makes it easier to believe that the pain is coming from our brains and not our bodies. If you already have some exceptions, great. If not, that's okay too. As you practice the techniques of pain reprocessing therapy, you'll start discovering your own exceptions, building a case. In addition to exceptions, there are other ways to get evidence that your pain isn't physically caused. Does your pain seem to ebb and flow based on your stress level? When your symptoms first started, did they come out of nowhere? Has your pain persisted beyond the normal course of healing? These signs, check out the full list in the appendix, can help you build a convincing case that your pain is neuroplastic. I encourage you to look back over your experiences to see if you can find evidence that points to neuroplastic pain. To demonstrate the evidence gathering process, here are the cases of two patients, Rebecca and Barry. Rebecca. Rebecca was a college senior with a solid work ethic, a promising future, and a slightly unhealthy obsession with her dog. A few months before graduation, Rebecca started getting pain in her wrists. It became a daily struggle, and soon she developed a conditioned response. Typing. The longer she typed, the worse her pain got. Not an ideal situation for a college student. She bought an ergonomic desk and keyboard, but they didn't help. By the time she made it through finals, 
She was deep in the pain-fear cycle. She spent the next couple of years terrified of typing, looking for the rare job that didn't include computer use. When I first met with Rebecca, we started searching for evidence that her pain was neuroplastic. Unfortunately, she had no exceptions. Typing always caused her pain, so we kept looking. Here's what we came up with. First, she didn't have an injury preceding the onset of pain. Her symptoms just appeared one day out of nowhere. That's very common with neuroplastic pain. Second, the pain came on during a pretty stressful time. She was about to graduate and had no idea what she wanted to do with her life. That is, outside of updating her dog's Instagram. Third, she had a history of both neck pain and knee pain. Both lasted for months. Multiple unrelated symptoms are indicative of neuroplastic pain. Fourth, both her wrists started hurting at the same time. That's huge. Outside of an injury or disease, when two symptoms arise in mirror image of each other, both hands, both feet, etc., that's a dead giveaway. With these four pieces of evidence, we were able to conclude that her pain was neuroplastic. Barry. Barry's pain started with a rather bizarre injury. He was waiting for a cab outside a bar and was randomly punched by a drunk stranger. It cracked two of his teeth. Even though the culprit was arrested and paid for Barry's dental bills, the damage was done. Barry developed pain in his mouth that lasted for the next six years. Barry was determined to figure out what was causing his pain. He met with dentists, oral surgeons, and neurologists. Consequently, he was diagnosed with myofascial pain, trigeminal neuralgia, and burning mouth syndrome. Yikes. By the time I met Barry, he tried every treatment imaginable, from dental splints to root canals. Understandably, it was hard for him to believe that his pain was neuroplastic. Every diagnosis he'd been given and every treatment he'd received reinforced that his pain was physically caused. So we started off by looking for evidence. Here's what we found. First, despite his many diagnoses, his mouth had healed. Over the years, Barry got x-rays, MRIs, and CT scans, and every image showed the same thing. There was no discernible sign of damage. Second, his pain was a lot better in the mornings. When symptoms follow a pattern where they're better or worse depending on the time of day, that points to neuroplastic pain. Third, there was the Tony Robbins incident. This might be my all-time favorite piece of evidence. A couple of years ago, Tony Robbins, the renowned motivational speaker, gave a talk at Barry's corporate retreat. The speech was so powerful, so full of hope, that Barry's pain completely disappeared. For two full weeks he was pain-free. Though his symptoms returned, this was a huge piece of evidence. Like my Lakers game experience, the Tony Robbins incident was an exception, and it allowed us to conclude that there was nothing physically wrong with Barry's mouth, reinforcing the evidence. Both Rebecca and Barry had enough evidence to determine that their pain was neuroplastic. But sometimes having conclusive evidence isn't enough. The night of my magical Lakers experience, I remember thinking, now I know that my pain is neuroplastic. I'm free. Then the following night, I went out to dinner, and as soon as I sat down, my back started hurting. It felt like my epiphany flew out the window. No matter how much evidence we have, it can be hard to hold on to when we're in a pain state. So we don't want to just gather evidence. We want to reinforce it. Some of my patients like to make an evidence sheet, a list of all the support that shows they have neuroplastic pain. By way of example, here are the evidence sheets that Rebecca and Barry created. Rebecca. 1. Pain came out of nowhere. 2. Pain came on when I was super stressed. 3. Symptoms in multiple parts of my body. 4. Pain started in both wrists at same time. Nice try, brain. Barry. 1. CT skin showed that mouth is totally healed. 2. Pain is better in the morning. 3. No pain for two weeks after Tony Robbins' talk. If you think you'd find it helpful, create your own evidence sheet. It's best to review it when you're having doubts that your pain is neuroplastic. The more you reinforce that your pain isn't dangerous, the easier it is to believe. And the more you believe, the easier it is to break out of the pain-fear cycle. In the next chapter, I'll teach you somatic tracking, the single most powerful technique of pain reprocessing therapy. It's a simple but effective skill that changes your brain's relationship with your pain.